Hello and welcome to NCAS Live, uh, the latest webinar, webinar number six uh, from the Nationwide Caterers Association. Uh, today we have um, a food safety legend, there's no other way of saying it, uh, Jenny Morris, um, who's going to be uh, taking us through um, some changes that hopefully you guys can implement uh, to get out trading again. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's tuned in for the previous uh, editions of the show. Uh, and obviously everyone that's come along and um, contributed, given their opinions, given their thoughts and, and shared their, their knowledge. Um, there's been a lot going on recently uh, within NCAS uh, in order to try and get you guys out there trading again as soon as possible. Uh, I know some of you guys already are, uh, but there hasn't necessarily been clarity as to whether you're allowed to or what you need to do in order to trade. Uh, and obviously there are new issues with regards to COVID-19 that need to be considered. Uh, before you can go out and trade safely. So Jenny has been absolutely instrumental in helping us to um, make some changes or to, to get the changes that we have. Um, and um, and she's been advising us throughout that process. Uh, she's also been um, the person developing the new advice, essentially. Uh, although we have helped where we can, uh, it's been Jenny's baby, really. And um, and it's fantastic. So hopefully you'll all, all have got a copy of that on uh, Thursday evening. I believe we're sending out another copy this evening uh, with a little, a couple of little updates in there, just a bit of clarification. Uh, and I guess there may be a little bit more after this if people have got some interesting questions. Um, my colleagues have given me a script to work from, which I'm famously bad at. So I'm just going to double check that I haven't missed anything already um, before I bring you through to it. But I'll just kind of go talk to you about what we've been trying to achieve, really, because uh, one of our main concerns uh, when the COVID crisis began uh, was obviously that there was nowhere for anyone to trade. Um, the festivals were gone, the street food markets were gone, functions were gone, uh, and before long, restaurants and, and other hospitality businesses were asked to close. So um, regardless of whether the government uh, are or were or could or will uh, provide financial support to the sector, uh, we felt that it would be essential to try and find a way to get people trading um, so they could earn a living and stay in business um, and obviously, when the, the grant didn't come through as hoped initially, um, that became even more important. Part of the problem um, that some of you guys have been experiencing, I know some some guys have been street trading, have been stopped by police, stopped by enforcement officers, had complaints from the public, um, are quite often doing everything properly. But there's not necessarily, or there hasn't necessarily been clarity about what the safe way to operate is, whether people should be out trading, whether people have the right to be out trading and things like that. And a lot of it has come down to um, street trading regulations. So there's a law called the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act, which covers all kinds of miscellaneous things, including uh, what we try and do, which is trading on the streets. And um, we're going to go through a little bit about that with Jenny, but I think we're going to try and mostly stick to um, the slightly more dry but essential um, food safety and COVID safety stuff today. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main issue that we've had is that while restaurants were able to change to takeaways and many of them also received government grants um mobile caterers were in theory allowed to change to takeaways but they had nowhere to trade from because they had no fixed premises to put their trailer on or their unit or whatever that may be uh, to trade from um we spent probably two months now uh, discussing this with the department of business with um the communities department and also with the local government association who've been really, really helpful um, in understanding the problem because we've taken quite a big problem to them. We've basically said 10,000 food businesses have nowhere to trade and now they want to go to your borough and potentially trade from there. Um, so it's quite a big ask. Um, and obviously there's a lot going on within local authorities at the moment as they scramble to try and uh, deliver the essential services to, to support the, the fight against COVID-19. So they are under extreme pressure. Um, our members financially potentially are under quite extreme pressure uh, and so we're looking to trade. And so it kind of fell on us to find a way through this mess and to find a way that will enable um, most of you guys, if you want to and feel safe to and are able to, to, to earn a living uh, as we move through this crisis. Um, I always talk too much, so maybe I should, I should move on to Jenny. Um, but uh, just before I do that, um, I'd say that uh, with the advice we sent out last week, we also sent the updated advice from the local government association. Uh, they 
uh, feed information down to local authorities and the, the issue with the local authorities miscellaneous provisions acts probably for the name uh, you can work it out is that it's decisions are made on local authority level so we couldn't go to government and say can you fix this um, because the law says it's a problem for or a responsibility for the local authorities so we've got what we hope is a, a workable fix for, for most of you guys uh, but it, what it will mean is that you're going to have to be flexible and you're going to have to understand the concerns of the local authorities. Um, and if you get a little knockback, um, then you look at how we work around that, not um, getting upset that, that that your plan for, for doing it hasn't worked out. There maybe will be another way of doing it. So uh, it's about being understanding and being respectful and recognising that these guys are uh, extremely busy and they're being asked to help you, but they aren't obliged to help you. So it's a case of uh, the more um, helpful we can be in, and more generous and more transparent and more honest uh, and upfront about what we're hoping to do and why we believe it's safe, the more likely we are to get a positive response from our local authorities. So uh, as I said, um, I, I've talked too much as ever. Um, so I'm going to introduce you uh, to Jenny Morris. Some of you guys may have, may have seen her at um NCAS congresses or conferences or street food live things like that um but jenny um obviously uh welcome to the to the webinar um, you've been a, a massive help specifically to me but also to NCAS and, and our members for for many years now um and and i think that when when this all happened having you on board has been an absolute godsend really because you know, your experience and, and your knowledge of the industry and the various different sectors of it uh, has enabled us to sort of navigate so, some new seas, really. So, um, Jenny, from your perspective, um, kind of what are the issues with trading at the moment um, and, and, and what should traders be looking to consider? What would be their first steps if they are looking to go out and trade? Oh, before I go there, Mark, what I need to say is I'm really, really pleased to be helping NCAS and its members. And I think you're all excellent in the ways you look to innovate and change and to think that is those are the watchwords at the moment because we're in a completely unknown situation which is moving very fast you've got to be very flexible and nimble to move so the document that you asked me to look at and i've been helping to produce is about how you can innovate and change or how you could because I'm from an enforcement background, although I started out in a food business. But as an EHO, my primary duty is to make sure that to support business first, but also to make sure that everyone is safe, whether they're working in the business or they're using the business. So this document, as you pointed out, might to some of your members seem a bit dry. It's not the fun stuff of working on the streets or being a mobile trader or even having a fixed premises. Its aim is to keep you safe and legal. So that is the, uh, the initial bit. So the starting point of that is bearing in mind safe and legal is you have to be honest when you look at your business to see if you can pivot it to make it a takeaway. Because we've got two things to consider here. One is can you meet the, um, the protections that are required? to prevent or limit the transfer of COVID-19. And secondly, the bit you've always been working with, but it hasn't disappeared, which is making sure you can produce food safely. So that's the intention from my point of this document is to help all your members say, yes, I'm interested in this, doing this, but can I realistically do it? Because you could waste a lot of time, money, effort, and get nowhere or be stopped fairly soon. I want you to succeed first time out. Brilliant, brilliant. And how would you, um, I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, I've been extremely concerned about the, the whole idea that people are so keen to work that they'll take things on and, and hope to learn on the job. Um, but, you know, obviously certainly things like ready meals um, are one of the issues that me and you have discussed and a lot of people have been asking questions of our account managers how do i do that i mean would, would you say that um that is an example of, of something where some of our customers might not actually be able to and, and should and it's essential that they are honest with themselves um that they, they shouldn't be taking a risk on this kind of thing absolutely right um 
I've had quite a bit of history before environmental health in catering. And I have come to the view that you can actually cater anywhere and you can do it safely. But the first decision you have to make before you even look at your premises is what is it I want to do? When you have an idea of what it is you want to do, it could be based on what you did before, or you might have done a little bit of market research around to say, what's the demand for? Start with thinking, what is it I want to produce? It might be ready meals, as you said. When you've got that idea, you have to be absolutely honest and you have to go and look at your catering facilities and say, first, can I produce safe food here? And all ANCAST members should know what that means because you provide lots of advice, there's lots of training, you do your risk assessments. That will tell you what you should do. But if you are thinking about doing something different, you have to actually think, I'm starting a new business and go back to basics. But to help you do that, because that's quite daunting, this pack has uh, an assessment form to talk you through the kind of food you want to do. And when you've got that idea, to then work you through the requirements for food hygiene. Now, you might, after you've done that, think, well, this isn't going to work. I'd say don't give up. Just look at what it is you want to do. Is there something simpler you can do? Because it goes back to the point, you can do almost anything, but if you've got very little in the way of facilities, it's got to be pretty simple. So that's the first bit. It's about assessing your premises. And as you put it, you've got to be brutally honest because you might think you can do it when you know really it's not going to be possible, but it'll catch you out in the long run, whether it's an enforcement officer or people being made ill and you don't want more problems. So that's the first bit. Look at the food, do an assessment of your facility. I mean, I, I, we kind of talked about a bit, obviously my fault, um, but um, in terms of um, COVID safety, uh, yep. do you think that um, that the advice given will enable people to trade and, 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 and how will that affect how they're trading? So the first bit, as I've said, is assess the food hygiene of your premises to see if you can do what you want. Then you've got to do the second bit, which is COVID which is there is in part of this document, a COVID controls document, where NCAS has done a generic risk assessment saying, what is it we know we've got to do? And what does that look like in practice? So you've decided, shall we say, that you want to do this food offer, you've got the right catering facilities. That's not the end of it, of course. You've actually now got to look at the COVID controls. And in my view, the hardest bit you're going to have to do is the social or physical distancing. Can your systems work so that you can keep people two metres apart? Can Do you have to share equipment? Because that's a no-no. Have you got things like refrigerators? Could you have use one bit for one person working, another bit for another? What about the common touch areas like handles and things? So you've got to look physical facilities and you've got to look at your working systems the only way out of that one which I'm told might be uh, quite common amongst your members if you are members of the same household when you don't have to do it okay so so if you basically if you if you live with your business partner or your your partner partner uh, and you work together um, then you you're considered as essentially one person is that right well, you're considered if, if one of you gets sick, the other one will get it. Or if you're both safe, you stay safe effectively. You're not trying. Social distancing is about avoiding transfer from one person to the other. And clearly, if you've got it, you shouldn't be in there, there in the first place. But, but actually, yes, your difficulty will come uh, if someone comes up and says you're working too close together you've got to recognize that people won't know you're members of the same household and you're going to have to be able to explain to them you mentioned at the start that you've got people trading doing it quite legally who are subject to challenge this document is partly there to help you deal with any challenges that you have i mean that's that's really important because at the moment i mean i think that there's there's some statistics come out recently about a lack of trust in the delivery apps or some of the delivery apps. Um, and I think that, you know, the public are rightfully quite concerned about hygiene and safety. 
uh, you know, the middle of a pandemic, the uh, invisible mugger, as Boris called it. Um, you know, and I think that we, it, it could be easy to to misunderstand how seriously some people are taking it. Um, and, you know, we should never assume that because we're doing it right, then people assume we're doing it right. Uh, and we need to really demonstrate and possibly even go over the top to you know, to demonstrate to both the public and to, to the authorities that we understand the risks, we're mitigating the risks, we're doing everything we can to do things safely and that we won't take risks with, with people's health uh, or with, you know, breaking the whole uh, idea of social distancing. Um, you know, so, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what are the risks in terms of people not taking this seriously, apart from obviously customers dying or members, members <laughs> dying? Or, Oh, well, I mean, the, you've only got to look at the number of cases and you and the number of serious illnesses and the serious deaths. No one wants that. And so the controls, in a way, the things we can do about it is remember this is a respiratory um, disease. That's why you have social distancing, because the estimate is if there are coughs and sneezes, you'll be far enough apart. Clearly, if you've got any of those symptoms, you shouldn't be working. And what this document does, it does that generic risk assessment. It looks at where are the risks coming from and it tells you what you need to do about it. So firstly, to have the separation. Secondly, to have a very good system to report illness and to stop people coming to work if they've got any symptoms, the high temperature, the cough, etc. Then you've got cleaning regimes. Um, and then you've got things like, could we pay by electronic means rather than cash? Some people can, some people can't. If you can, it's the best way to do it. Then you've got things about keeping your customers away from staff to have your separation if you've got a queue. You'll all have seen it outside the supermarkets. You've got markings there to keep people apart to help them actually work out what two metres is. You probably get different estimates if you ask lots of different people about how much that looks like in distance. And the thing the business can do is go through all that, but you then know you've done it. Your customers don't necessarily. That's why you've got your customer notice out there saying to the customers, we're doing all these things to keep you safe. This is what we'll do. This is what we'd like you to do. You've got your compliance statement in there where the business has gone through everything and says, yes, I can do that, or I can do virtually that with a slight variation because not every business is the same. That's the bit you could show to any enforcement officer who comes along, probably won't get many of them. But what you've done is you've got documents, paperwork, which most people think is pretty boring, but it's really good evidence to show that you've done things properly. Don't think it's a waste of time because it actually isn't. If the worst happens, what you could do is you could say, well, here's the proof. This is what I did. Um, and it should be fine, provided you go through it, provided you when you know it wouldn't work for you. You've got to be brutally honest about all this. I mean, due diligence is the only thing that can protect people if something goes wrong or if enforcement turns up. You know, if basically if, go on, sorry. No, I was saying basically carry on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I think you know, due diligence, you know, being able to demonstrate that you've considered all of the risks that you put measures in place to prevent those risks from becoming a reality and keeping records to show that you've been you know analyzing it and, and, and making sure that your your processes are working essentially is the only thing that's going to save you uh if you end up in court uh yeah. in my and 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 with covid the only way you're going to get an eho coming out to visit you is if a member of the public has called them um so the chances are they're coming with uh with a reason to come so if you see an enforcement officer then you need to be prepared and you need to you know be almost over the top with yeah i completely understand the risks here and i'm doing everything i can because i don't want to get ill i don't want my partner or my staff or my customers to get ill and um and, and therefore i'm taking this extremely seriously and here this is proof that i'm taking it extremely seriously um i think if you get to the stage where you're having a disagreement with an environmental health officer you're you're losing and you're going to lose really um but yeah I, mean, I think that that for me that's a, a critical part of of this webinar it's getting across the message that if you are 
responsible and diligent, then there will be opportunities for you. They might not be the initial opportunity that you go for, but um, you can work through that. But if you don't, um, if you don't act diligently and you take risks, then not only are you putting the public at risk, uh, you're putting your business at risk. Um, you could end up being sanctioned in some way. Um, and you could also kill people. Uh, but also, because we don't have a sort of carte blanche, everyone could go out and trade, don't worry about it. Um, anyone at any moment could be pulled off the streets or pulled off from a, you know, they're told they can't trade from private land or or work from their own kitchen because they're not co they're not cooperating with the, the COVID standards or the, you know, what's required in terms of COVID safety. And I think that could really affect all NCAS members if the HO start pulling up members around the country not doing things properly. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Jenny? Would you, would you agree with that or do you think that's maybe a bit hardcore? No, I absolutely agree with you, Mark. You've talked about due diligence and there is the due diligence issue, but what um, NCAS members should not forget is we've got, because the COVID infection is so serious, we've got new legislation in as well. So enforcement officers can close you down on the spot um, and police can do that as well. It's not just EHOs. And there are now um, quite significant fines. And this is going to get even more serious, I think, as you get the partial reopening of the parts of the economy that haven't been operating. It's important to do that, but it's absolutely important to make sure it doesn't increase the infection risks. So I think certainly at the start, there are going to be a lot of challenges about are you meeting the requirements? Absolutely. And you are going to be people are going to be looking at documentation. Uh, so you're going to have EHOs coming out who might be good ones, but also health and safety ones as well, because the COVID control stuff, a lot of it is now coming under the health and safety arena. So get it right. You might have to have a bit of a discussion, but if you prove, produce your documents and show you're doing it right, you're in a good place. If you haven't got anything like that or you're bluffing it, I don't think you'll get away with it for long. Yeah, and, and we probably don't be able to help you either. Um, you know, if, if you're doing things properly and the EHO pulls you up on it um, and there's a, a disagreement about the best way to do things, possibly the way to put it, um, you know, the EHO believes that uh, the members should be doing it a different way uh, than what we've recommended, but they're doing it in the way that we recommend, then we can have a conversation with that EHO uh, and say, well, we think this is safe because. Uh, and it might be that they convince us otherwise and we change the advice. But um, if they are... If the member is not following the advice and an EHO or a police officer pulls them up on it, they're kind of on their own um, because we've given them the advice to do it safely and they haven't followed it. So um, really, this advice comes with that caveat. It's like don't don't put it in your unit and not use it um, because, you know, it, it's only through using advice like this um, that you will be able to trade confidently. And I think that there's a lot of customers out there worried that you know the public might report them for covid safety or the ehos might turn up and and shut them down because of these licensing issues um everyone needs to think about this constantly that you know your actions will be observed they will be potentially judged uh, and, and often by people who don't necessarily know uh, what covid safety looks like so before you know it you could have an eho there and you're explaining yourself so um that's not necessarily a problem as long as you can um but but yeah, I think that if there is a takeaway from this um, conversation, it's, you know, it's, it's diligence is everything and, and understanding the risks and, and treating the authorities uh, with the respect they deserve for pointing out those risks. You know, if they turn up at your door and say, what are you doing about why are you handling cash, for example, you better have a damn good reason why you're handling cash and what you're doing to, to mitigate those risks. And, and, and those risks, you know, should be... Um, mitigated by it so that, that's a conversation we've been having this morning um within the office um got quite heated at times about whether people should be um handling cash at all my opinion is there should be no cash handling but that's not necessarily the law um because it's the safest thing to do uh obviously there are some customers that do not believe that they can facilitate that approach and, and may want to take a different approach um but then it's about actually finding another safe way of handling cash um what what are your thoughts on that Jenny? what would would what what would your thought yeah what would your thoughts on safe safe handling of cash be um whatever it is it has to work for the business 
uh, my view is absolutely agree with you that um, electronic transfer contactless is the best way to go for this. And loads of people have moved to it. However, for some businesses, I quite accept that their customers may not wish to do this or be able to do it. I am not so comfortable about it, but as you pointed out, it's not the law that you can only play contactless. It's the preferred, the preferred way. So if you are going to take cash, then I think the things you are going to have to consider and you as a business owner are going to have to work it out is how you maintain the hygiene and how you keep the risk low. Clearly, the obvious one is making sure that any people handling cash wash their hands after every transaction. That gets a bit of a nuisance, actually. But the that would be good practice to do. Probably if you did two transactions, you could then wash your hands, ideally after every one. But if you've got loads of people paying in cash, it gets harder. The thing you have to remember, and I talked about it earlier, is how do you get COVID-19 infection? Well, you've got to get it inside your body. So if you touch cash that's contaminated, and then you rub your eyes, suck your fingers, all these things you know you shouldn't do, but we often do them without thinking about it too much, then there is a risk of transfer. That being said, I'm aware of this discussion you've had today, and I've been doing some Googling about it, and the World Health Organization is quite clear that in some cases, people want to and will need to work with cash. They haven't banned it, it's not banned. You have to recognize there are risks, and you also have to put controls in. Um, if I can just move on slightly from this, what this reveals to me, and, and it stretched me a bit trying to write this, is there are so many things that you have to consider when you're doing this, even things like, how are you gonna pay for it? Um, the document tries to guide you through it, and you've mentioned street trading as part of it, and you'll see in the um, guidance, it talks about what do you need a license for? What do you need a permission for? Um, street trading licenses are difficult to get if you haven't got them. The easiest option is to trade on private land. Uh, there is a bit in the guidance about that. The LGA, as you mentioned, has sent out um, advice to local authorities. And all the EHOs I talk with now say we want the, the twofold thing that I said at the start, which is we want to save to support safe businesses and as far as possible we will do so and there are some relaxations out there already around these kind of issues in recognition is that nobody has ever had to face anything like this in the past and it's about health and it's about economic success so an awful lot to think about there's more and more coming out a lot of it you if you look at the guidance and follow it is being done for you so i think you should do that wouldn't I'd say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, I think that you know, in terms of the licensing, um, it, it's quite confusing anyway because I think that um, each local authority will have to make their own decision on how they facilitate uh, businesses operating if they do. Uh, when we looked into it, uh, Jenny, it it kind of seemed that street trading, in as it's defined in law. Um, would be impractical for our guys anyway because they tend to be 12-month contracts. They tend to require um, planning permission, which obviously the planning departments are basically shut at the moment, um, and they tend to require consent uh, from the local authority and, and, and the licensing process there. Um, some local authorities we know are allowing people to trade from their homes uh, or from private land as long as they have permission to be there uh, with, without any uh, further consequences. Uh, some are asking them to go through processes such as paying for some form of license. But I think that uh, we're going to find a quite a different um, approach from different local authorities in, in, in how they feel the best way for them to, to, to manage this this issue is. Um, so I think it's, it's important to let your... It, obviously, you have to let your environmental health department know when you're changing your business processes anyway. That's that's the law. That's when you have to do. Um, so we are we've developed a letter through the NCAS Connect system. Um, so uh, once you've filled out all of your statements and your risk assessments and your pledges to to ensure that uh, you can trade COVID safely, uh, then you'll be able to uh, basically fire off a 
letter to your local environmental health department from the connect system which will say i'm looking to operate as a takeaway or a delivery or i'm doing ready meals or i've got a click and collect service or um, whatever the various different um uh sort of side hustles you guys are doing um uh, is going to be and then they will kind of get back to you and say well you might need to look at licensing or you might need to speak to this other department as well um, but the first point of call is to go through the environmental health department uh, and then possibly ask them do you, you know do your colleagues in licensing or, or other departments require further um, you know evidence or financial contributions or some form of contract um, and, and let them sort of feed it through um, and then if we do it through the connect system then we can manage um, where we're we getting pushback, where we're we getting positive responses, and and try and get a feeling for what where those you know, what what that pushback is. Are they the same problems, and and are they fixable? And can, can we work with members to to get them over the line? Really, um, so yeah, I would say that in terms of um, contact, getting the licensing in place. Uh, I think licensing is almost step two, and it might not even be a necessary step. The first point is to, or step three, even the first point is to make sure you can do what you're hoping to do safely do the assessments, as Jenny said, make sure you're honest with yourself and you're coming up with something that is feasible and safe, uh, and then propose that essentially to your local through the Connect system. Uh, and if they have any concerns uh, or recommendations, they will then get back to you. The other thing I'd say on that also is um, Connect is helpful because it enables transparency. So the more documentation that you have on there, uh, the better. So that's not just your COVID safety stuff, that's your hygiene score, that's your last hygiene inspection report, uh, and that's your risk assessments. And that hopefully brings me on to, um, will people need to change their risk assessments, Jenny? Their normal ones, the food and the health and safety and things like that? If they've changed what they're doing, absolutely yes. So almost inevitably, I think you will have to do it. So you might be different food, you might be different process, you might be using your facilities differently. So yes, go through both health and safety and the food safety risk assessment. One of the things in terms of health and safety, crosses over to food safety as well, of course, is cleaning. You may find that you want to use new chemicals because the chemicals you would normally be using in a food business are about getting rid of bugs or bacteria. We're looking at a different guy here. We're looking at a virus. A virus is effectively a dead but infective particle. And just because a chemical will kill bacteria, it doesn't mean it will get rid of viruses. You can't kill them because they're dead already, but you need to eliminate them or stop them causing you illness. So, so yes, so not only food safety, but health and safety as well. So we've had a question in saying, when does it stop becoming the council's responsibility and become the vendor's responsibility to maintain the two minutes dis uh, meter distancing? My thoughts on that is that it's always the vendor's responsibility to maintain the distancing. What are your thoughts on that, Jenny? Absolutely. It's the food business's responsibility. The council has really nothing much to do with that. They just make sure that the business is playing by the rules. I, th I think that's the important thing. It's a really good question, actually. It brings up a very important point in that, we are going to have to accept that there are things that are out of are normally out of our control that now we have to take responsibility for. Um, and the two meter distancing is a, is a prime example of that for me. Um, I'm quite hardcore on this, as you may have picked up. I'm basically, if it's, I, I think people should be doing uh, click and collect or delivery businesses. Uh, and I think there should be only cash, there should be no cash handling. That's my personal opinion. Um, the law isn't as strict as that. Um, not usually that not usual that I'm more strict than the law, but hey. Um, but um, you know, I think that in terms of social distancing within queuing from takeaways, uh, I find quite frightening that people are two meters away, even though that it's safe or you know generally safe. Um, but yeah, the the local authorities will see a catering trailer with people not um, two meters apart and just close the catering trailer down. They won't say, oh, you've got irresponsible customers that don't know what two metres looks like. What are your thoughts on that, Jenny? I think you're right. Um, there are workarounds on some things, but it gets messy, it gets complicated. Take the simple route. You know that you need to manage the two metre rule. Manage it. Um, you might say it's not my fault. I can leave it up to my customers to be sensible, but actually, it's your responsibility because you are attracting the crowd and you could say therefore because you're attracting the crowd good for business 
but you have a responsibility to make sure that they're not risking each other. Um, you can, I mean, you see it at those supermarkets. They quite often will have someone managing it. It might be in your business that you can can do so. At the very least, I'd expect some markings. You can do bits of paper or whatever, and that r usually works remarkably well. Actually, I think it's been said that the UK's public have been pretty good uh, compared to most other countries across the EU in respecting the rules. Of course, you have people who don't take it seriously. But for the main part, most people will follow them. With the business encouraging it, we should be OK. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally think that if you've got a website, um, it probably isn't that hard to get yourself a click and collect system built into it of some description. Yeah. Obviously, some of them are uh, more expensive and more complicated than others. I mean, Jenny's uh, helped a bit. Uh, we've uh, NCAS have helped uh, Deep Dining Club to set up the um, street food drive through which is opening properly this week. I had a soft launch last week. Um, and our thoughts behind that were um, basically from looking at fish and chip shops and going, there's people queuing up two metres apart. They look like they've all got cash. And then they're going into the shop to order the food. And then they're standing in the shop once they've ordered the food, waiting for it to be cooked. Um, and to me, that just seemed like too many risks in one. And obviously, um, Tip industry, they're, they're good people and I don't want them to stop trading. But when we look to develop the drive through, it's very much a case of try not to go in the building, try not to be face to face with the customer, try and take the money online and also tell them when to get there um, because then you don't have such an issue with queuing. So if you give someone a time to turn up um, and then the added bonus of that is that you can manage your stock quite nicely. So reduce the need for waste um, or the capacity for waste. Um, so that would be my kind of ideal thing to work towards but that's not necessarily going to be uh possible for all businesses and uh, one of the things mentioned within the lga advice was actually um roundsman um so jenny um i don't know how well you know the the, the world of roundsman um but i think that if anyone's going to be um challenged with these covid um uh, guidelines is possibly them uh, would you have any thoughts for, on you know for for people that are looking to do a food round i have to say i really don't have any experience on this mark um i think it's really messy thing to control and if at all possible i'd avoid it <laughs> okay no problem i mean i think i i, I agree i think it's been really tricky um i think that yeah it, it, there'll be a lot of thought that you need to put into it and i think that's the one where um you know, cash will become an issue again, obviously, and face-to-face -face ordering and social distancing. And, and also people are fiddling around in your coffee van or your sandwich van, checking what sandwich they want to buy. Then are they spreading um, the virus around there potentially? So uh, a lot to be thought about there. Um, but you know, these guys are potentially still trading and there. there is the potential for yeah. them to do so. I mean, they are allowed to do it. Don't get me wrong. I just think it is... I mean, it's hard enough to get the controls in place when you're a fixed premises and you can set out your queuing distance. When you keep moving, um, it's one thing to be a delivery. So if there are milk roundsmen, for instance, that will do you, you place your order online, they bring the milk and various other things and they deliver it to you. That kind of thing is simple. But if you're just stopping for people to click and collect at different places, it just starts getting harder to manage um i my view on it is take the simple way if you possibly can it's difficult enough anyway yeah uh, I, th I think you're right i think that maybe so one of my um i had a long chat with a couple of a couple of long chats with ice cream people uh, ice cream men and women and you know their their business model traditionally is more pied piper than um covid compliance um and it, it's a tricky one because you know you can't you know, if you're turning on chimes to, to get the kids running out of the houses, then you're basically breaking social distancing. So there will be some businesses that uh, would have to completely rethink how they're delivering what they're doing, I think. Um, and, and some of those yeah. would be routes, like the coffee vans and the ice cream vans and things like that. Um, and and it, I th it's a bit heartbreaking in a sense because there are some businesses that will that may really struggle to pivot to to a new form of trading during this this pandemic and i think that um you know th those are the kinds of businesses that are really going to have to maybe look afresh really about how they do it I mean, we had a guy um 
uh, Disco Fries. Um, they uh, were selling sort of cool, funky fries and dips and, and, and grilled halloumi, that kind of thing. Uh, really good business. Um, and then COVID happened and um, they completely changed their recipe because they thought if we're going to be working, selling food into the NHS, we should be doing healthy, hearty, batch cooked, um, you know, food that your grand used to make and that you, you've grown up loving, that kind of stuff. Um, because chips aren't going to work or, you know, fried goods aren't necessarily going to be yeah. hitting the right notes. And I think that, um, that there may be businesses, I think ice cream might be one of them, um, where it's either a case of looking at how do I make this a static enterprise or how do I um, change up a lot of what I'm doing? Um, and, and that would be a big challenge for them. Uh, I think you're right. Um, it's very hard to write guidance for such specific businesses as that. I mean, the, the principles are there. You've got to get your hygiene right, which if you are a food trader, whether you're an ice cream vendor or whatever, I'm assuming that you have because you've been doing it for a period of time. You've then just, just got to look at the COVID controls. And I think the hardest bit there is going to be how you manage that two, two metre separation, either within your vehicle um, or within your customers. It's going to be much harder to do, I think. Yeah, I think that ice cream potentially might work quite well if they just switched up to delivery of some kind. You know, they were literally doing, you know, they, the orders are online and they're turning up at people's homes and delivering in a safe way. Um, maybe not ice cream either, maybe some other uh, form of food or goods. I don't know. But, um, yes, yeah, so it's a tr troubling time for, for a lot of people, including those guys, but hopefully we'll help to find some solutions for them soon. Um, we're chatting away. We need to cover some stuff. I mean, in terms of um, especially things like ready meals uh, or food to reheat later on, um, where does that leave customers in terms of um, labelling or allergens? What 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 new requirements okay. might? Okay. Well, this is quite a difficult one because you're actually moving from a catering business to um, effectively a mini manufacturer. So you're pre-packed now. And that means the uh, labelling requirements have gone up. So the uh, guidance give you, gives you a bit of information about that. You've got to provide a lot more details. Don't forget the basics, of course, which are allergens. If you've gone to a different product, you may have new allergens in that product. It may be a bit similar to what you had before. You might find that you have got problems in supply because Quite often you don't have much choice now. You have something similar to what you had before, but you're going to have to look if you're doing substitutions like that about are there any new allergens that have crept in? You're going to need to think about all that. So you're going to have to provide those details. The other bit I think you're going to need to look at is um, instruction use. So if you are going to reheat it, you've got to put in the instructions about how hot it's got to be. People may say 63 degrees centigrade. To me, that's a reheat temperature. I think you're talking about um, a cook temperature. Consider it to cook if it's been pre-cooked. Business also, of course, has to think before it gets there how it's going to cook down, cool down all this stuff if it's bulk cooked it. And you've got to cook it fast. Um, if you're doing this as a business and you're doing a lot of it, you're really probably going to need a, um, a blast chiller. And that's difficult to accommodate. It's expensive. There are various ways you can cool things down. If you look at the pack, there's quite a few of the basics of food hygiene about cooking and cooling and reheating and shelf life in there. I know it's not about pivoting. I know it's not about COVID controls, but you're actually going to have to go back to some of the basics. So do have a look at that because there's a lot of detailed information in there. You have to think about your packaging. It has to be suitable for what it is you're doing. Sounds obvious, but not always so. And it be, must be safe for contact with food. And if you start looking at packaging, the quick way to tell that is you almost get like a little wine glass symbol on it, which says this is a material suitable for food. So there are several different elements in here that you are going to need to think about. Very hard to do it on your own. Work through the pack read the things take your bit of time but it's a worthwhile investment yeah absolutely I think it's worth um 
reminding everyone that you know food poisoning uh, if it does happen destroys your immune system so a lot of these ready meals are going to uh, the nhs hospitals and they are going to the resilience hubs who are helping people who are shielding at home because they are vulnerable the last thing that you want to do is make those people ill uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, and that is the consequences of getting this wrong so you need to be very aware of those consequences before you start making decisions about um swiveling your business to something that's totally different that, that maybe you don't have the experience or the knowledge to do for those of you that do have that experience or knowledge let us know um you know if you have these processes in place if this is something you're already doing uh we do have clients that are uh looking for that um but we you know we're, we're, we're looking to push forward people that can demonstrate that they they know exactly what they're doing because you know the risk to human health is far too great to to allow someone to have a punt at it really um i think i've seen a question up here saying um Will, will NCAS be doing a street food plan, a gazebo plan to enable people to get back out onto the streets and to trade? Um, possibly on a level. I think my, my preference is always going to be for um, click and collect or, or, or delivery. Uh, so if someone's, you're cooking out uh, on the, you know, on a car park or somewhere and someone comes to pick your food up and delivers it somewhere else, uh, or you cook it and your customer knows where they're coming uh, and then they turn up at the right time and then there's a table couple of meters away from your food stall and they go and get the food off that and off they go again the big problem um and this comes back to the thing i said earlier about um people being all of a sudden you're now responsible for the behavior of your customers which is something that you haven't been before but you will be considered to be responsible for them now because the risk is greater than the benefit of, of you being there in the in the eyes of the local authorities so if you're not um expecting or enabling your customers to keep two meters separate uh, you'll get shut down. Um, so what we're very reluctant to do is to say, yes, you know, go back on the streets. What we're saying is if you do go out and trade, you need to find ways of making sure that uh, it's done in a safe way. And if that means two meter distancing, um, then that's what you've got to do. Uh, the main, One of the main things that we're hearing from local authorities is loitering is a major concern. And you might say, well, that just isn't my problem. So I'm buying some food off me. Uh, and they sit down on the curb and start eating and chatting away. How's that my problem? Um, it is their problem now, isn't it, Jenny? It is indeed. Yeah. So again, I'd say, you know, do have a look through all this guidance. I talked about some of the basic stuff before. The thing it's probably worth mentioning, Mark, is that a lot of that basics is assured guidance from your primary authority. So it has particular standing, um, which it means it's going to be accepted by all EHOs. And that's a really good thing to know. Yes, yeah, so that's the, all of the sort of food safety stuff and the, the health and safety stuff in there uh, would be assured. It's just the new COVID stuff that's not gone for assurance yet. Is that right? That's right, as I understand it. Cool. So, but we will be looking to, um, we've been putting this, I mean, I think you finished it Thursday afternoon and we or Thursday morning we managed to get it out Thursday evening. So um and now we're changing it again. So um our our, our lovely friends in, in Greenwich and Momusha uh, will be seeing that uh, soon and, and be able to feedback on that and hopefully assure it or uh, make some tweaks then assure it. Um but yeah, I mean it is in terms of having the confidence to go out and trade, um, I would hope that this document if filled out properly and uh, followed responsibly, um, should enable uh, NCAS members to, to go out and trade again. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jenny? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's good. I think that as far as I can see it, um, NCAS has a very good relationship with its primary authorities um, and it seems to be working very well. And that is huge advantage to all your members. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I think that you know, it's been a it's been a long journey in terms of getting to this point. Uh, in many ways, it's this journey is only just beginning. But we're very lucky to have got to this point. We've worked very hard to get to this point. I'm just, you know, that's Jenny. That's all you caterers out there. Obviously, it's everyone within the NCAS team uh, slogging away to uh, to try and get you guys the opportunity to get out there uh, and earn a living. And we appreciate that it might not be as lucrative as as it has been in the past, and it might be more difficult to do, and it may come with greater risk and responsibility um but that's kind of the world that we're in now um maybe not forever but certainly for the time being and um it's about how we adapt and how we take on board uh the new rules of the game 
and and fit into them and, and deliver food that is safe and that is that is tasty and delightful um but is yeah is safe and gives the confidence gives confidence to the public and to the authorities that uh ncas members are safe and responsible food businesses and that they are doing their best and doing everything possible to keep the public safe while running their businesses um i see this as a real opportunity for the mobile catering sector if we get this right uh the restaurants are going to be shut for six to nine months uh even when they reopen they're going to be socially distancing so uh on low capacity um you know your big chain takeaways and drive throughs your um and evil cloud and other such burger restaurants um you know they won't be working at full capacity either so uh if we get this right then there's a massive market out there for you guys but if we get it wrong then that might all get snatched away from us so um today's seminar really or seminar uh, webinar really is, is good news it's it's saying that there, there is a possibility for you to keep your business going for you to earn a living in the coming months but these are the new rules to play by and make sure that you know the rules before you start playing them and make sure you're adhering to them because if you don't the consequences are going to be far worse than if you just didn't trade in the first place um so yeah be be responsible be diligent read through it or make sure it applies to what you're doing uh speak to your account manager if that's helpful firing questions to us if that's helpful um and, and share best practice amongst you um like i said i'm very much in favor of the drive through click and collect and um and delivery options as being safest from an ncas member perspective and the the least likely to get you issues uh with the authorities uh but some of you will operate as takeaways and, and as uh, roundsmen and will do so safely but just be aware that you know that there will be uh, extra kind of eyes on you to, to make sure that you are doing that properly and that uh, the behavior of your customers may not be in your direct control but it will be your responsibility unfortunately so when planning your business think about that plan that into it i mean one of the main things with the drive-through was was the um uh, stopping people from uh, loitering was if they're in a car and you kick them out the other end that they came in they're going to drive off uh, so the idea was that the drive-through built in the sort of anti-loitering uh, mechanism. Um, but if you're on the streets, that could get quite difficult. And if you're taking walk-up orders and you're on the streets, that could get really difficult. And you might end up in arguments with people and all sorts of things. So I think that you really need to think about how you're going to manage your situation when you're out there doing it. I think that um, it might be harder to get set up um, it might take a little bit longer, but I would definitely explore things like click and collect uh, as an option because if your EHO turns up and says, what are you doing serving food here? You can turn around and go, I'm not serving food to the public. I'm, I'm, I'm handing out food to people who have already bought it off me and they're only coming up to, for things they've ordered. So there is no loitering. There is, all of these other things are, are removed from it. And so that that's my take on it, but it's, it's a kind of more complicated version of Jenny's take on it, which is keep it simple. Keep it simple and make sure it works. And if you do that, you'll be okay. Uh, and if you're overcomplicating it, then maybe you're doing it wrong. Um, so um, I think we may be running out of time. Jenny, um, thank you so much for today. Uh, and, and obviously all of the work that you've done on this. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you throughout it. Um, and I think that we put out some of the best advice uh, that NCAS have ever put out uh, on the back of this in, in, in quick, smart time and hopefully People will be able to make use of it and to, to benefit from it and to get out there and, and earn a living and, and and to start putting some of these worries behind them. But um, thank you so much for this. Obviously, guys, um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll continue to answer some questions on uh, on Facebook and so forth. Um, and uh, and we'll potentially also do some stuff on the drive through. If anyone's got any questions on that, I'll try and get some, uh, some replies out there for you as well. But uh, really good news. Um, it was a bit drier than, than the usual fun chats that, that we have on these webinars, but I think it was very important that we did it and um, hopefully it was very informative for you. But you know, we've worked very hard to get um, the local government association to um, to understand the problem and the, the scope of the problem and, and what how they can potentially help. And they put out some really good advice, uh, which is as much as they could possibly do. Uh, to encourage local authorities to work with you guys and to to help you guys to to start earning a living again, but you've got to meet them halfway on that. And, and, and this advice that that Jenny's developed for us or with us um, 
is, is a step in the right direction for that. So um, you get an email this afternoon that will uh, be a repeat of, but a slightly updated version of the advice. Please do read through it. Please do uh, assess whether uh, what different types of pivot um, you might be able to do within your business and, and might be profitable, successful for you, uh, and then sort of move move on from there. But we will support you through this process. Um, we believe that many of you, if not most of you, should be able to go out and trade on the streets or not necessarily on private land uh, with the permission of your local authority, but you have to work with them and listen to them and 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 cooperate with them in terms of how you go about doing that. And if they say first time round, don't like the look of that, then, you know, suck it up and come back with another idea. Don't argue with them. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found it helpful. Jenny, you've been absolutely wonderful um, and really informative. But yeah, keep the questions coming in. Thank you very much. And we will see you next time. See you later, guys.